This is a lifetime of work. Continental Reckoning, the American West in the Age of Expansion. One of the most fascinating subjects, I think, in the history of the human race. Crazy story of the amount of change that took place over a relatively short period of time. Yeah, 30 years. Yeah, and how little most people really understand about the actual history of the Native Americans and and that. One of the things that was most fascinating about the Mediator podcast was that at the time that Lewis and Clark had come to America, a hundred years before that, there had been Native Americans that had traveled to France. That's right. And met with the king. That's right. Yep, yep, yep. Um, that's right. Uh, 18 or 1720s, uh, there was a group of, of Native people from Kansas, Missouri area, and they had been accorded by the French because the French wanted to expand their fur trade into uh, into that area up the Missouri River. So they uh, and the Spanish had recently suffered a terrible military defeat there in sort of what's today eastern eastern Nebraska. So so the French sent this guy named uh, Etienne Bourgmont to make contact. He already had contact there. In fact, he had a son by one of the women in the Missouri tribe. Uh, made contact, made some friends, made some allies. Uh, courted them, and then to sort of seal the deal, he took back a delegation of about six Indians. Now, this is from eastern Nebraska. Right? Which <laughs> tribe was this? There were several tribes, the Missouri tribe, the Illinois tribe, uh, I think some Osage. Uh, and they were uh, – Then he, he then took them back from there down the Mississippi, down to New Orleans, and then over across the Atlantic uh, to Le Havre. And then they went by coach from there to Paris, uh, and they spent several months there uh, in Paris, being fitted by uh, King Louis the Fifteenth, uh, visiting the Paris Opera, which they said was a great place full of sorcerers. <laughs> <laughs> sorcerers, <laughs> sorcerers. Why uh, did they describe it as sorcerers? I, I think they figured uh, these people were just sort of transformed for their eyes. You know, they just became somebody else. They're great actors, of course. Oh. And I think that was it. Uh, they saw this famous uh, puppet show. On a Pont Neuf uh, bridge, and they said it was, uh, this place was inhabited by small dwarfs. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And they loved, they loved it. They, had, they were taken to the uh, Court de Fontainebleau. Uh, they, ex- they showed their uh, expertise at hunting by riding bareback in the Bois de Boulogne, the, you know, the royal woods, naked and bareback, uh, shooting uh, pheasants. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Had a great time. One of them, uh, a woman who was, in fact, the, the woman who had borne Bergman's child, uh, she married a, a sergeant uh, in Notre Dame. Uh, they, had a, they had a wonderful time, and the, the men liked just about everything except, uh, except the men, the other men, the French men. Uh, they said they were sort of effeminate and sissy, and, and, <laughs> and uh, they said they, uh, said they smelled like alligators. <laughs> I'm alligators? Not, yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, but this was a uh, you know this seventeen twenties, so that's uh, that's what eighty years or something before before Lewis and Clark even made it out to that area. That is so fascinating. Yeah. Now, what was the language barrier? How did they communicate? Well, uh, there were Borgmont himself uh, had uh, lived for years uh, among the Indians, and it was an expert on the Missouri River. So he was a he was a Frenchman who came over. Uh, enlisted in the army, deserted, uh, sort of went native, and became a uh, you know coureur de bois, a, a French mountain man. Uh, took up with the Indians, uh, had this child by this woman, so he knew he knew the language just quite well. Uh, and there were other uh, remember these these Indians, as you can tell in this story, uh, were very cosmopolitan, you know, very sophisticated. They knew English, or some some of them did. Uh, so I think the point to remember is that this. Long before our image of you know, Americans you know, mm. uh, coming into this area, there was all sorts of contact uh, between uh, Native peoples and Europeans, all sorts of exchanges. Uh, it was a really a mixed world. So first Europeans arrive here essentially in the 1400s, right? Uh, yes. The very, very well, first. Very first, late, very late 1400s. So yeah. this is... 200 plus years after that. That's right. So we're essentially talking about us thinking about the 1820s. Yeah. Right? That's right. So there was hundreds of years of Europeans slowly making their way across the continental United States. That's right. 
Spanish coming up from the south, of Cabeza course. Cabeza de Vaca. Cabeza de Vaca, uh, 1520s. Uh, French coming in quite early up to the what's today the northeast, uh, eastern Canada. Uh, that had been going on, of course, a long time uh, before the English began their very slow and timid expansion into the uh, beyond the Appalachians. So. It's interesting because if you ask the general public about the expansion, they, they seem to put it into the time period of the 1800s. That's right. But there was so much more going on, sure. hundreds of years of that, which is hard for us to imagine. Again, it's like us thinking that the 1800s, like 1823, was just yesterday. It wasn't. Right. It was a long Correct. time ago. So there's hundreds of years. Before that. But yeah. That, that's right. And that had been going on slowly. It was sort of a slow simmer of these two, of these cultures, the cultures coming together, you know. Uh, and so um, in many ways, you know, which the Indians were far more sophisticated and well-traveled, far-traveled, uh, than the than the Americans who were who were coming in there. <laughs> we think, you know, our, our national myth has it that when Lewis and Clark, this is in, you know, 1804, 1806, Lewis and Clark make their way up the Missouri River into the West. That's sort of the start of the history of the West. Before that, right. uh, Lewis's famous quote as they left the Mandan villages uh, in 1805 says, we're uh, heading up. He compared himself to Columbus. They said, mm. we're heading into this place where the, the foot of civilized man has never trodden. <laughs> <laughs> Not true. Not true. <laughs> no. Well, to the best of their knowledge, well, which is interesting also, right? The amount of information that was available back then. It was so difficult to find out what was going on. Well, sure. Just like today, you know, information is power. Right. And you don't want to let your imperial rivals know what's out there. You don't want them to know what you know. Right. So it's just right, these sort of state secrets, yeah? So, have you read uh, the uh, Cabeza de Baca book, uh, A Strange New Land? Yes, I have. A Land So Strange. That a Land So Strange. Land right. so strange. Uh, Andres Resendez. Yeah. Which is a fascinating book because they essentially document the spread of disease without meaning to do it. Because that, that is really where it all started from. A lot of it did, yeah. It's a wonderful book, yeah. It's an amazing book. And, you know, they talk about culture. They, like, they talk about the Mayas. And... You know, there's always been this confusion as to what happened to the Mayas, but it's probably the same exact thing that happened to 90 plus percent of the Native Americans that contacted smallpox. Maybe uh, the Mayas declined a, a good bit before that, but but who knows? It, it's very hard to say. But certainly, disease uh, was a very important factor uh, in the conquest of Native peoples and the in the uh, conquest by Europeans of of North America and South America.